Selenko, Senior Lecturer in Work Psychology at Loughborough University here in the UK. And their paper is entitled The Psychological Consequences of Economic Vulnerability. Thank you very much. Okay, hello, good morning. My name is Eva Selenko. I'm very proud to present our research today for you here. Um, I'm doing this talk together with Katharina Kluck, who is going to take over from me and who is in charge of the slides. Um, we're going to present our research um, on psychological consequences of economic vulnerability that has been just recently published in the special issue of EWO. We, in contrast to a previous speaker, take a more quantitative perspective, but I promise you we have not included lots of numbers here, so I hope it will be enjoyable to follow. Um, so this talk, I would also like to mention John Eve uh, Gerlitz, colleague of Katerina, sociologist, who gave us loads of input on how to define our concepts more clearly. So let's get started into this exciting topic. What's, what, is going to what are you going to expect next? So as a small agenda, we thought I'm going to give you a little bit of background to our study and a little bit of theory. And then Katerina is going to take over with the empirical study and the practical implications of that. All right, so um, in work poverty is the topic we are focusing on. And this is a, a very widespread phenomenon, unfortunately, in the European context uh, nowadays. So we see that um, in work poverty is generally defined as consisting of um, a situation where someone earns under 60% of the median household income, despite being in work. And loads of people are unfortunately in this situation. So there is uh, nine to 10% of Europeans are at risk of that phenomenon. And this is expected to rise. In the UK, we see that there are, this numbers is even slightly higher from the chosen brown tree plantation. I have um, numbers of 13.4% here. Um, and uh, also we see that 33% of Germans are currently living in this situation. So um, there's this robust myth actually inherent in societies that work would protect us from poverty. But unfortunately, as we can see, this is no longer true. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, the low wages, unfortunately, are something that is quite common. Um, and uh, we define those as um, earning under 60% of the median gross hourly wage. And if we look at national data, international comparisons, and we see on average 15% of European workers who suffer from that situation. Um, and this is even more dramatic since the pandemic where we heard that you know, Europeans report they have no savings and we expect these numbers to actually get worse. So these numbers are from before the pandemic but um, at least what we know now from, in, from reports, this has become even worse. So why is this an issue psychologically speaking? Psychologically speaking, a lack of money can be seen as a source of stress. We know that having money is kind of the manifest benefit of work. When you work, this like, it's the most basic function. Why do you work? Well, we all need to put food on our table. So money is kind of like the manifest function of work, according to Yehoda. And not having money is also one of the most fundamental sources of stress. So if you ask people in representative surveys, open question, what are the most stressful things in your life? Money always ranks among the top two together with work. This is quite fascinating. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to look into the Stress in America surveys done by the American Psychological Association. So this shows us that money worries, and of course also worries about work, are featured very highly in the daily lives of people. However, and this is something that I found really curious, work psychology or occupational health psychology still kind of ignores this issue. So it is as if money issues are something outside work, but we know very well they are at least often caused by work or at least um, caused by lack of work. So for our paper, we decided to disentangle this a little bit more. So we looked into economic vulnerability. Could I have the next slide? Okay, so this is the thing, the concept that we're looking at. Um, in economics, people define this as an economy and economy's exposure to exogenous shocks. But at the individual level, we would define it as a risk to a person's self-sufficiency. 
of affording themselves a decent life. And we would say, well, this consists of objective indicators and of subjective indicators. And when we look at those, this conceptualization of economic vulnerability, and this is not just us saying this, but this goes back to quite an old literature actually, and here are some, some more recent um, references, we could basically say, well, economic vulnerability for worker consists of two situations. One is the objective employment situation, the objective income situation, and the other is the subjective situation. So um, the financial strain, the perceived financial strain, the perceived income inadequacy. And of course, these two things correlate. Someone who has low wage will also perceive financial strain but they're not correlating perfectly as with many things in, this, in, in, in psychological life. So both of them have advantages. Um, to, if you look, at, would look only at, let's say, income indicators, and you could say, well, I have an objective measure here. However, this often doesn't cover psychological needs and um, also you know, doesn't explain why an income is not enough, for example. On the other hand, if you only look at financial strain, then you run the danger that you know that have maybe an inflated sense here because financial strain might correlate with other aspects of the person's life, like unemployment or high cost of living. So I think to understand economic vulnerability, it would be important to take both indicators on board. So that's interesting me saying that as a psychologist, but we want objective indicators and we want subjective indicators here. Okay. And there is already quite a lot of evidence here on the relationship of these two things with health and well-being. So there is quite a lot of literature on the objective side showing us that people with low income and uh, suffer from more health problems. Um, they suffer from material deprivation. Um, and we see also on the subjective side also already some, some evidence accumulating showing us that people who suffer from financial strain, who are worried about their income, about their finances, have mental health problems, they have worries falling asleep, they have worse physical health, and they also um, have you know, more psychological stress. So we do see these correlations, we see these relationships. Um, what is a little bit less clear is why do these things happen? So I would like to go a little bit into depth here now because um, this is what our study is also about. We wanted to actually focus on, okay, why do people, how can we explain this relationship? You know, why is, why is earning not a lot so bad for people? So basically we're looking at economic vulnerability and there are several explanations for why economic vulnerability is bad for people. And one very common one is the stress perspective. So for one, um, being economically vulnerable, earning less and um, suffering from it is a source of stress. But then we also have other mechanisms that play a role. So for example, we have cognitive explanations like um, earning not so much uh, violates your social ex exchange expectations. As a valued worker, you might also expect to be valued in terms of, in terms of getting a good income. It's also social dimensions. So earning not a lot excludes you from social participation like Ross showed us in, in her opening slides. Um, if, you cannot, if you cannot earn, if you don't earn enough, you cannot um, pay your child a present to participate in a birthday uh, party, but you yourself cannot go for a coffee with a friend. So it is also socially excluding. We could also argue that it is a source of identity threat because as a decent worker, as an appreciated member of society, you would also understand to be appreciated in the sense of you know, economic value. And these are all very good explanations, um, perhaps most directly, however, um, economic vulnerability is going to undermine the amount of control you have over your life. So basically, if you don't have enough money, um, or if you're really low on money, it makes daily life very much out of your control. For example, you might be on your way somewhere and you might be suddenly you know, getting a little bit hungry. If you have little money, you cannot afford yourself a sandwich. You, you, you might have food at home, but not, you cannot just do this extra three pounds. Or it might start raining and you cannot afford yourself an umbrella. 
these are all just daily small hassles of you know not having control over your daily life. But of course, there are also bigger hassles. Let's say your boiler breaks down or so. So not having enough money or worrying about money makes, let's say, navigating daily life much more troublesome. So your sense of control over your life, over things that are happening to you, is certainly diminished. So you could have the next slide, please. Okay, so we were looking at sense of control as an explanatory mechanism. Could it be that basically economic vulnerability reduces the sense of control and that might perhaps explain health consequences? So this was our basic question. What is sense of control? So just a short uh, depth dive into that. Um, it's defined as the belief that an individual maintains about the extent to which they can shape the course of their own social outcomes. So most broad definition actually. It's basically your belief do I have some kind of control over my daily life, basically? Um, it's seen as an important resource for men mental health and well-being. Some originally understood this as a learned personality variable, um, but we also know from research that it now changes over the life course. And there is already um, a, a little bit of research on this sense of control concept. So for example, we see that, um, and this is also our argument, that sense of control is related to economic vulnerability. So we see that um, from other research that economic vulnerability restricts actual control over life. So other research has shown us that people in vulnerable situations feel less in control. Previous research has also shown us that, um, that, this, um, that being vulnerable despite working violates distributive justice perceptions. So the sense of control seems to be related to other explanations that we have. And we have also seen that this economic vulnerability is related to unfavorable employment conditions. And we have seen that the financial situation basically is associated with a sense of control, with a reduced sense of control. So basically we have evidence for this relationship, um, you know, for individual parts of this relationship, vulnerability, sense of control, health outcomes but we do not have evidence for the whole process. And we do not know, well, so is this really an explainer and how does it look over time? And how do these things change over time? And this is why we did the current study. So I'm gonna hand over to Katerina now, who is going to take you through our study through the Imperial background and the results. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I will be taking over and tell you a bit about what we uh, did empirically. We were very uh, pleased to have our paper included in the special issue on, uh, on living wages. And we looked, as Eva has so nicely explained, as at both objective and subjective indicators of economic vulnerability, their effects on mental well-being, and especially also on why it might affect mental well-being with sense of control as um, a potential explaining mechanism. Um, just a brief overview, the specific indicators that we looked at in this study were on the objective side, uh, low labor income. So we're not looking at hourly wages and we're also not looking at household poverty, but um, at the individual level, the idea is, is, are your individual earnings below or above the poverty line for a single person household? Like, could you support yourself as an independent household if you had to? Um, and on the subjective side, we looked at financial strain in terms of people's perceived um, financial worries, so specifically these effective reactions and how much people worried about their personal economic situation. Um, and we, with these indicators, we tested our hypotheses, first of all, that both objectively low earnings and um, subjective financial strain will have independent effects on people's mental well-being. Um, and second, that part of this explanation is people's sense of control, so that economic vulnerability leads to a lower sense of control, which then re relates to lower mental health. And we also wanted to see what happens when you look separately at the differences between people and how much vulnerability they have accumulated over time, but also what happens when you follow people over time and their economic vulnerability changes. Um, 
Just a few words on our databases. We analyze data from the German socioeconomic panel study, which is a huge longitudinal study surveying over 12,000 households every year since uh, the 80s. And in this, we were able to identify over 7,000 people from whom we had data on their earnings, their sense of control, um, mental health and life satisfaction for a time frame <clears throat> of 19 years. And um, we also took into account, which is of course really important, many other socioeconomic aspects that could influence both your income and your well-being um, to make sure we disentangle these effects, especially because we're looking at individual earnings on the subjective side. It was important to control for the type of household that people lived in and their, uh, their household's income. So um, we have more detail on the statistics in an appendix. If you're interested for now, I just want to summarize in words what we found. Um, when you compare people to each other, the objective low labor income effect was actually not so robust when you take into account those control variables. So those seem to be um, really, it seems to be the broader life circumstances that account for this effect. But the perceived financial strain, when people worry about their finances, they actually show lower sense of control and lower, lower mental well-being than those who have to worry less. And interestingly, when you get into this within person level following people over time, we did see a robust effect of changes in and out of low income. So when you fall below that threshold, um, your sense of control will drop and so will your mental well-being. And the same with um, changes in people's subjective financial strain. In times when they worried more about money, they also showed lower sense of control than usual and lower mental well-being. So on this, in terms of changes over time, these effects were very robust. Um, so if we summarize what we found and what we concluded from this, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, maybe you can sort some things out in the Q&A as well. But in general, what our findings mean is that individual low labor income and financial strain had negative effects um, on mental well-being by a sense of control that were independent of the household, which is also important to keep in mind. Um, and this was especially prominent if you looked at changes over time when people fall below that threshold or move above, it's actually their sense of control and consequently their mental well-being changes accordingly. Um, this was more robust than if you looked at the accumulated differences between people. In general, our findings are also in line with previous research showing that this sense of control is really a key psychological valuable variable that, that links broader social conditions to people uh, people's individual health. So this is a really um, important mechanism here. And an interesting auxiliary finding was also that when you follow people over a long time, you actually see quite some change in this, um, what many perceive as a rather stable personality variable that is sense of control. So um, there's, for example, the research that has linked trade sense of control to people's later earnings, but our findings show that it can also go the other way around, that people's employment conditions and especially their financial um, financial strain can undermine sense of control over time. And that has then negative effects on well-being. So what follows in terms of practical implications, I think especially here and today where everything is about living wages, we can agree that we need to address pay and access to work as the root causes of economic vulnerability and make sure people don't uh, end up in that situation in the first place. Um, the pandemic has also highlighted the need for um, policy efforts to protect people from income losses or income shocks, especially when you look at these changes or the volatility over time, it becomes really clear that that's, that's something that needs to be prevented. Um, of course, employers could also look at other measures like indirect compensation or fringe benefits, even financial counseling that might buffer some of these effects. But again, the root cause would be um, to pay people decent living wages or make sure they have access to as much work as they need to. And um, with that, I would like to end with a quote that I came across in a podcast that I like to listen to, which nicely summarizes this idea of control, um, which says poor people have too few choices. So by giving them more choice will improve their lives. And the way to give them more choice is by giving them more income. So, um, and with that,
I would like to say thank you very much for listening. You can contact us with um, questions via email or follow us on Twitter. And for everyone who's attending the EWOP conference in Glasgow next year, we're also hosting a symposium there on precarious work. So we'd also be happy to meet up in person. Thank you. Thank you.